Christmas. But, you know, it's wonderful to actually feel like I'm part of the classroom today. And um, we've enjoyed a wonderful, wonderful working relationship with DKIT. And I remember the first event I went to go, went to many years ago, Catherine, and just seeing the employment rate for the graduates of DKIT, it was so high. And I was just sitting there going, I am so not surprised. And um, so I suppose, first of all, you know, you've all been working hard for the last four years. Well done for getting this far. And you're so lucky with the education and the career paths that you have now as a result of all of that hard work. So today, my presentation is kind of two parts. The first is just to talk a little bit about the Peter McBerry Trust, what we do, why we do it and how we do it. And, you know, maybe throw out some of the opportunities we would have as an organization for you. And then the second part is I just do a little bit of what I call my top interview tips. So I know you're all thinking of the next steps now. So I hope, you know, you'll, you'll all take something from the presentation today. So I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the Peter McFerry Trust. And um, so the Peter McFerry Trust was set up almost 40 years ago today by our founder, Father Peter McFerry. And, you know, when you start with somebody with a very pure and, and clear vision and a vision for good and a vision for change, it's always a good starting point. So Peter trained to be a priest and his first assignment was in Ballymun. And um, so Peter's driving home one evening, it's about eight o'clock, you know, saw so many young people on the street and was really puzzled because in Peter's head, you know, at eight o'clock at night, you're at home, you had your homework done, you had eaten your dinner and you're probably just, you know, chilling out before you went to bed to get ready for school the next morning. So Peter chatted to the kids, you know, what are you doing out? Why aren't you going home? And he was just horrified. Kids wouldn't go home because their parents were active in addiction. One young person was sent out to prostitute themselves and um, somebody else was sent out to score heroin. And these were the days where Ballymun in the, the 70s when heroin was such a massive, massive issue. So Peter thought this is not right. And of course, Peter being Peter, got to work and we set up our very first um, service, which was an under 18 service. And from there, I suppose the whole organization grew. What were the other presenting issues with, with people? Heroin, addiction was absolutely huge in the inner city. So Peter then worked on setting up addiction services. So over the last 40 years, I suppose, how we've we grown, how we've developed, we have grown and developed from looking at where are the needs, what supports to people who are marginalized need and that's how the whole organization grew so i'll break down into the different types of services we offer and the type of people that we work with and what the work looks like on a very practical basis so i suppose overall our mission it's very simple it's to reduce homelessness and it's to work with people who are you know suffering from from drug use they're at social disadvantage and we provide what we call low threshold entry services so our doors are open to everybody. If you have mental health issues, if you have addiction issues, no matter what your presenting problems are, we will work with you and we will do our best to support you and we will hold you in unconditional positive regard. Um, we're also very excited to be doing a lot of work on Housing First and really pleased to say that Open County Laird, our Housing First is really, really, really growing and developing. We have what we would call a dream team in, in Housing First um, in Laird. And um, we have a social worker, we have a psychiatric nurse, we have intensive case managers who are people with social care work or community youth and community work ex um, degrees. So we're really proud to be seeing this huge structure which is being rolled around people in the housing first model and um, as i said at the start peter's ambitious okay so peter's ambition is to make all of us in the organization redundant and you know we're quite a step away from that and i suppose to think well well how is that going to happen a lot of what we offer is temporary accommodation it is a temporary solution nobody wants to be living in one of our services for any longer than they need to. So our overall goal is to provide houses and support people into their own housing. So the housing first model is really, really exciting because this works with people who are very entrenched in their addiction, people who could be right now rough sleeping. And the idea is to get these people into their own homes and put in place all of these wraparound supports so this person can then maintain their tenancy and get the supports to deal with their mental health, get the support to deal with their addiction. So we're sort of building up multidisciplinary teams of which the intensive case managers, you know, are an absolute key part of the whole process. So we're really excited to be part of that Housing First initiative. 
And we see that as the future. And it's the only way that homelessness, as we know, it, will ever, ever come to, to a full end. So when you think of homeless services, you think, I wonder what they look like, how do they present? So we would have a lot of what we call STAs, which are supported temporary accommodations. And typically what will come to our STAs are anybody probably from the age of 19, 20 onwards who are homeless. So we have services for males, we have services for females, and um, they're not an ideal situation at all. In, in some of our larger services, we have a lot up in Balbriggan and um, Swords, the north of the city, and um, you could have maybe 50 to 60 people living in that service. It's shared accommodation. And for us working in those services, there's a huge mm -hmm. On the health and safety and you know the, the i suppose caring for the people in our care because they are very vulnerable and that's because they may have chronic mental health issues and they most likely are engaged in addiction in fact probably over 80 percent of the people we work with have mental health and addiction issues so a day working in that service it's very very busy can you imagine as i say it's like a big busy house okay dinner, breakfast, lunch, people coming in, people going out, challenging behaviors, you know, all of these things come with the territory because if you if you are, are you know, active in your addiction, you're panicking about where you're gonna get the money, where are you going to get your next score? If you have mental health issues, you could be suffering from paranoia, you know? And then just the mere fact of so many people contained in one building, you know, tempers will fray. So a day in the life of, of a social care worker would be, you know, coming on shift at 12 o'clock. Um, you might be doing room checks for the day. And the room checks are like welfare checks. They're just checking that the person who's in our care is actually okay that they aren't overdosed they aren't unconscious and um, so it'll be dealing with people coming up going i can't find this i want to use the wash machine and um, can you help me fill out the form you know whatever it is people present with we will do our best to support them with that need and then as core staff you'd all have your own caseload so you'd be working individually with people you know assessing their needs listening to them what do they want what does the future hold for them and you know it's very important if you're going to work in peter mcberry um how you feel about the work what is your personal ethos you know we all have a part to play in 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 the great world of social care and for many it's about finding well where where is the best fit for me so I would say to people, we work with very marginalized people, very active in their addiction, and we work off what's called a harm reduction model. So that would mean that we will support somebody to use as safely as possible. And in practicality, what would that look like? That would be talking to somebody who's an IV user and saying to them, look, you know, are you disposing of your needles? Are you getting clean needles? You know, if your injection site is becoming infected, you need to rotate your injection site. OK, now some people might feel they're better, better fit and more able to give, you know, in a role where people have gone into recovery and need support maintaining that recovery. So there is a place for everybody, but it's very important that you would give a lot of thought to about well, where where do I fit in this whole scenario? Where is where can I bring the best value to the people that I'm working with? So. Our, our, our STAs, which would be probably 30 or 40, the service we have, they're very big, they're very busy, they're very chaotic. Now, I know I'm painting a bit of a bleak picture, but what about the nice side of working with the STAs? You know, people will engage with you and they'll say, you know, you're the first person who's ever listened to me. Nobody ever asked me what I wanted before. I, I really feel like I, I, I have a clear path about what I'd like to do. Now I'm getting my social welfare. Thank you very much. Now I have an income every week. So you get all of these small things where people are feeling valued. People are saying to you, thank you for listening to me. And that will be on a daily basis, what we call the small wins, which, you know, make it get up worth going in every day and just keep them going. Um, so there's just some shots of, of some of our homeless services. We try and appoint them to the highest standard we can. And, and why does that matter? I talked about unconditional positive regard at the start. We need to treat people with respect. Nobody ever woke up as a young person and thought, oh, I'd like to be homeless. I, I will, you know, nobody ever had a life ambition to be homeless or a drug addict. So when people come to our services, they're at a very, very low point. OK, so when people walk in, the least we can do is have it clean. OK, because if somebody comes in, the floor is dirty, chipped cups, stained plates, you know, not enough cutlery. We're communicating with that person. Look, here you are. 
this is how we value you. This is where we see your place in society, chipped cup and a dirty plate. So we would be, I'd say, you know, clean freaks in the Peter McBray Trust, because a lot of what we have to work with is, is what we have to work with. We have the buildings. OK, so the only way we can communicate that we will treat you with respect, that we think your dignity is important, is by making sure that what we provide is to the highest level that we can provide. We also have a number of family services in the Peter McBray Trust. And for me, you know, I think it resonated one day, you know, being with the head of the family services, and she said, you know, we have a big responsibility, like people in our services have big responsibilities. But she said in the families, we're part of memories. And it just pulled me up short. Can you imagine that that responsibility of being part of creating somebody's memory? So if you think of family occasions, you think of communions, birthdays, Christmas, a lot of families are spending those life moments in our services. So we are part of, of that family's narrative. We're part of some in the future 22 year olds, two Christmases, his birthdays. So it's so important that in the family services, again, you know, that we uphold ourselves to a high standard and that we make the services as, as best we can for that period in time for when families are staying with us. I mean, long term, we don't even know the impact of families. On, of homelessness on families you know it's the studies that will be carried out over the coming years that will look at young people who've gone through family services and seen the knock-on effect it's had on them so what can we do we're very solution focused we don't look at the what is and you know what what might happen or whatever we look at the here and now and say okay what can we actually do as a person as a worker as an organization how can we make this situation the best that we can so that is exactly what we do. And we do have a family service up in, um, we have one in Navan, and um, we have one in uh, Drogheda as well. And um, so, I mean, we are really happy to see the number of people that we managed to move through those services and families, because for us, that's what all it's all about, is getting people into their own homes. And the amount of move-ons we get from the families, it's extraordinarily rewarding. And anybody in the family service will say the best day is when you're packing a family up and they're waving goodbye. It's the day we all, the day we all want for our families. So I, I talked about addiction as well. Addiction is, is, is a huge issue. You know, as I said, years ago was heroin. And then what happened was um, if you wanted to be housed in, in, in local authority housing, you couldn't be a drug addict because you were not allowed on the housing list. So then, you know, everybody was trying to come up with a solution. And the solution then was to go on a treatment program, you know, to give up heroin. But giving up heroin was very, very difficult. So the alternative offered was a methadone program. So if you went on to methadone, you were on a treatment program. So therefore, you weren't officially an addict. So therefore, officially, you could go on the housing list. So methadone, you know, served a purpose. It helped get people off heroin. But the other side is her methadone itself is highly addictive, okay? And people could be on methadone for years and years and years. So we would have a huge amount of people in our organization who would, who would take methadone. And, you know, some people will give it up. Some people with us, you know, will say, look, you know, I take X number of mils a day. I'm okay with that. I'm happy with that. And if the person's happy with it, we're gone. We respect that. And if you are living the life you want, the fulfilled life you want, and you're taking your method on, that's absolutely, we're happy that it's working. But a lot of people, they want to stop. So for people then, addiction and recovery would be a really, really big part of what we do. And in fact, it's a very growing part of the services that we offer. So the first step in, in recovery, I suppose, is what we would call stabilization. Many of the people who access our service are polyvalent drug users, okay? So they are using a number of different substances. So for them, it has to be medically uh, supervised, this what we call stabilization. So it's actually trying to wean people off maybe one or to lower the doses of things they're taking. So they will engage with stabilization services. And um, that could be for six weeks. Our, our residential program is six to 10 weeks. And uh, then a person gets to a certain point and you, you can't just stop everything just say, right, I'm stopping and I'll go into recovery and whatever. You really have to lower the doses gradually because it's such a shock to the system. Your chances of success of going sort of cold turkey are very, very, very slim. And in fact, you're very much in danger of overdosing because you don't take anything for two days and then you're so craving something, you are high likelihood of overdosing. 
So people engage in the stabilization and it's hard work. It's really, really hard work. So again, that is social care workers, people like yourselves with your background who engage with people. It's group work. It's, you know, daily living skills. It's meditation. We use all these different things to help people try and find a way, a coping mechanism. Because at the end of the day, addiction was never a life choice for people. Addiction is absolutely because we would say of trauma. Absolutely, no shadow of a doubt, trauma, you know, sustained trauma. We, we we think that in our services, most people in our services had had a minimum of seven to eight serious traumas in their childhood. Okay, so that could be a parent overdosing, that could be their best friend dropping dead. You know, when I say traumas, I'm talking serious, serious traumas. Okay, so then when people get to a certain point, they will go into the treatment. So treatment is when you're probably... 70% of the way there, you're still uh, taking some substances, but now you're actually going to go from, like with methadone, you come into Garvestown in 50 mils, and then you go down to zero. So we're blessed to have this wonderful facility in um, um, County Meath. Uh, it's near Ashburn, and this is where we run our treatment and recovery. So treatment is putting down, so we work with people who are addicted to methadone, alcohol, uh, cannabis, cocaine. And then once they've gone through that six to 10 week program, they have put it down, they've dealt with that underlying trauma, hopefully in a way that means, you know, now they have a coping mechanism going forward. And then they go into the recovery program, which is, you know, gradually reintegrating back into society. You could be going to Blanche, going to see a movie, bumping into some of your mates who are still using and they're going, oh, how are you getting on? Have a joint, what do you think? You know, so it's just a kind of a, a supported re-entry back into your normal life. And then after their people are finished on the treatment and recovery, they will go on to live in our drug-free housing if they have a need for housing at that point. And again, it's that supports that are in place. You're living with other people who have gone through the same journey because it's very hard and there's, there's ups and downs. So it's really important that when you hit a bit of a trough, that that support is there. And as an organization, that, that support is there for us 24 seven, seven days a week. And then we do a lot of work in prevention services, you know, to try and never get to that point. And we do, we, we become involved in some educational uh, centers now. So we would offer alternative educational pathways for young people for whom mainstream school is not working. And again, mm -hmm. guess who supports all the work there? It's people like ourselves, it's social care workers. So you can see for us, that social care workers, people with youth and community, you're the absolute underlying linchpin to everything that we do in the organization. Um, and it's work that's much valued. The, the, the education and learning are really, really exciting. You know, um, I interviewed a woodwork teacher the other day, and uh, he was such a, he was such a wonderful person. He really had the ethos, he's such a great attitude. But the manager of the learning center asked him, you know, in woodwork, you know, what, what would you make with the kids? You know, and having spoken with, with the manager of the center, I knew that for a lot of people, you know, they've never had responsibility. They've never made anything. They've never had, you know, you go home with your paintings and you go, oh, I can make this in school or, you know, it's just that sense of achievement and, and people looking and going, that's great. So in woodwork, they'd make a lot of different things. And I know previously they made little tables and lamps and drawers, you know, like really nice things that go home and show and say, I made this today. And everybody could ooh and ah and go, you're great. So anyway, we asked him, like, what, what would he make in the woodwork class, you know? And I think he was still more in his mainstream school where, you know, if you're doing the junior search, you need to be making certain joints and, you know what I mean, showing particular skills. So he said he was, he'd make windows with the kids. And I can remember laughing, I said, windows? Like, what would you be making windows for? And he goes, oh, will you get the joints and everything else? And I was going, oh my God, can you imagine now the kids going home with these big windows, like, and, and the parents thinking I'm going to have to knock a hole in the wall now to, to put in the window. Just so the child gets that, I've made something that's of value. So we had a little chat around the window and then he was coming up with great alternative ideas and worrying less about the kids getting the value in the joints. And I suppose that kind of sums up what we do and how we do it, okay? You look to the people you work with. OK, you understand, you listen to them. We meet their needs. What's important to them? What do they want? And that is that will shape the work that we do, because bottom line, it's client centered and we hold people in unconditional positive regard. <clears throat> what matters to us is that people will leave our services in a much better place than when they came into them. 
So we start with the under 18s and the under 18s and the aftercare services that we offer are as important as ever to the organization. You know, we have five under 18 houses now. And again, it's, it's, it's people like yourselves that'll be working in there. It's our social care workers. And you know, what you're trying to do is give people the best path, you know, and that's really, really important. Nobody ever chose the, the life they were given, you know, it's how it just played out. And we've really got to think, well, how can we, poor people for better outcomes so the under 18s absolutely wonderful and then we have our aftercare services which are really really important in that progression because you leave under 18s okay and you know the state's entitled to you kind of finishes at the age of 18 and you know how can you support this person they're probably doing their leaving step. they might want to go to college you know you can't just take away all that support and go oh there you go so the aftercare then is where people are transitioning from living in that protected under 18s developing those independent living skills kind of get themselves into college or out to work or you know cooking their dinner buying the food having the friends over having the friends go managing all these pieces of things we all take for granted because you're living at home you're somebody be going to hear listen your mates have got to go it's 10 o'clock you got to get up but imagine if you don't have that we've all learned from those around us and you know it's really really important so we're really proud of the aftercare service that we do and it just really really just gives people the best possible opportunities and development so then as i mentioned our regional services so we were a very much dublin based and then we kind of crept to loud and then to wicklow and kildare and galway and limerick so we now i suppose and cork so now we are unfortunately in one way becoming nationwide but for us the positives of becoming nationwide a lot of our regional services are housing i talked about housing up in Louth, and um, we've got our housing all over the midlands limerick cork so a lot of our housing is this housing first so for us we get excited to be opening up housing offices okay because this is long-term solution this is this is where we want to be so so yes yeah, so we're, we're probably quite national now and um, so today i'd love to tell you about our graduate program so you know People who are motivated by the work that we do, the people that we work with, and I suppose people that get our ethos. So we, we every year we have our graduate program and not even COVID, just COVID stopped us, which I'm really, really proud of. And the graduate program, it's a really nice way to enter. You come in as more staff, you come in on a salary, you know, proper salary, fixed term contract. It's a really, really good way to onboard into a company. Some feedback I've been getting from people like you guys is, you know, like people, you have all the qualifications, you've done some placements, you're ready to go. And a little bit in there is kind of gone, oh God, will I be okay? Can I do it? You know, that little bit of a, I'm not sure I'm good enough. So first up, yes, you are good enough. Okay, remember that. And second of all, this is where the graduate program is, is fantastic because we have a group coming mm -hmm. together we have a support network there everybody has their little wobble i always say to people months two months in you're on the bus and you're going oh my god is this is this what i want and look that's normal it's such a transition from being a student into real life and the big bad world we all have our moments but in the graduate program you're fully fully supported through that so there's a little bit of an overview of, of what we want it's all there on the website and um, the salary then is actually a little bit higher than what i have there it's now 33 360 so that is your starting salary and then because we would do residential shifts um, and anti-social work like we're open seven days a week and um, every day and um, there's social allowances on top of that as well so that's probably another 20 25 percent on top of the starting salary so you're on the bones of 40 grand coming in on the graduate program so and the other thing then is you know we try and look at where people will be best fitted you know what are your skills what's your interest areas and we'll try and facilitate that learning and development for you and like let's think about it you know we have we have over 50 services we have everything we've under 18s we have housing we have aftercare we have families we have stas we have addiction stabilization you're going to get a wealth of experience in the peanut Ferry trust you know so so it's, it's a good place to come to so all the details are on our website. The other piece that I really like to talk to everybody about is, you know, I mean, I would see responsibility for us as an organization, you know, when we talk to you guys, like, first of all, look, I'd love to have you all come and want to work for us. But the other side is, you know, it's not for some of you and you may have other ideas where you'd like to be. So we always like to give everybody a little takeaway, you know, 
on something hopefully that would be of value to you all. And what I would say is, you know, I spend my days making the next day hires for the Peter McBray Trust. Okay. And I could share, you know, in a few minutes with you my top tips for interviewing and what you really, really, really need to do as you know, graduates heading out into the into the workplace. You know, you probably have gathered by now it's your market. You know, and it's wonderful. You know, for years, I think people who worked in social care or social care roles always felt kind of on the peripheries and marginalized. I think COVID has really thrown a light on, on the work that's done and the great work that's done. And really, the world is your oyster now. You, you'll have your choice of, of where you want to go. But I say it to everybody, like, we're all hiring staff. We all really, really want people. But there's certain things that are just, from an employer's perspective, Unfor unforgivable okay and the first one would be i'd say to you all research the organization for which you're interviewing okay so what do i mean by that if, if you're interviewing with peter mcferry trust i i would expect you to go on the website and i think you know i'd like you to be listening to the participant stories and like you say well why does that matter because you can tell me about it it matters because you listen to the participant you'll hear the life they had you'll hear the way they are speaking about themselves now You'll hear how they describe where they're at. They may still be active in their addiction. They may still have issues. But you'll get the way that they feel valued, the way they felt respected, and the way they felt supported. So you will understand the nature of the people that we work with in the Peter McBerry Trust. And you will understand how we carry out the work. And very quickly, you will identify, this is for me or this is not for me. OK, so no matter where you're applying to, the first thing you need to do is you really need to study the organization, know what's their ethos, and be able to say why you would like to work there. OK, so when I ask people, why would you like to work in the Peter McBerry Trust? I, I really, you know, would prefer not to hear. I need the experience. I want to do a master's in social work. I want to you know, do psychology. I, I need to learn more. I prefer to hear less about, you know, what's in it for you, okay? And maybe more about, you know, well, you know, I heard Peter on the radio and I thought he was very solution focused. And I like the fact the doors are open to everybody. And I like the fact that he makes a difference. And I'd love to be part of an organization that makes a difference. So for me, I'm now just kind of well... Oh. Joe, I don't know if you can hear me, but you've stalled a bit there. Has it stalled for you, Rita, as well? Can you hear what, Catherine? I can hear you, yeah, yeah. It could be her own internet that maybe dropped. I have my laptop as well, just in case, but I think, I think we're okay. Oh, she's back now. Joe, you, you're still there for us for a minute. <laughs> Mid flow, mid flow. <laughs> so, and I think I was saying about the importance of doing your research. Okay, yeah. it was just, and I like that's what I was saying. When people speak like that, I don't need people reading the website and reciting it back to me. It's just I want to see you. I want to hear you. I want to hear what you think. Okay, so I think that's really, really important that you do your research on the organisation, and it shows a few things. I talk about respect all the time. So when I'm doing an interview, I have your CV. I have notes. And I have a manager, I have read your CV, I will ask you questions, I'll write down your answers. So I may afford you that respect where I am going to bring the best out in you. So it is a two way thing. OK, so people need to prepare for interview. So how do you prepare for interview? At this point, I assume you all have your CVs done up. You really, really should have. OK, so in social care settings and youth and community, it's really important there are no gaps in your CV. And um, if you are, you know, returned to college as a mature student, just put down what you're doing. Do not leave gaps. So important. OK, if you were a stay at home mum or dad for six years, just put it down. Put down every job you have. It, every job is relevant because the fact that you worked tells me something about you. I don't like people saying in an interview, oh, I didn't put that down because it's not relevant. You know, everything is relevant. Working in, in a cafe, working in a petrol station, they are all relevant. You're dealing with people. So you need to put everything down. So I would say to you, do up a really good CV, put all your different experiences down. And then what you have is most organizations have an application form. So now you can cut and paste from your CV into the organization's application. 
and it's always going to be, you know, you put a bit of thought into it, so you're putting your best foot forward. The second thing you need to think of is, you know, when any interviewer is going to say, talk me through your CV, okay? So how are you going to sell yourself in 10 minutes? You have spent like probably what, 18 years at this point in time in full-time education between national secretary and third level. So how long are you going to spend on the interview for the job that's going to be your career for the next 30 odd years? Okay, so you need to do a bit of a race on it. I'm not saying spend six months or a week or whatever, but I am saying you would want to be thinking spending a good couple of hours researching the organization and then how are you going to sell yourself? Okay, so I will say to people, tell me your story. And I'll normally say, start with your leave insert. Okay. So I want to hear, well, I picked youth and community in Dundalk because when I was in fourth year in college, I knew somebody who went to such a group, thought it was great, did a bit of reading about it. Just talk to me, tell me your story. Because now I'm assessing your motivation. I'm seeing your interest and I'm hearing your passion. So talk your way through your CV. Talk about the different places you've had. Always give a positive. OK, we really don't want to be hearing negatives. And, you know, look, we've all done placements and, you know, maybe the only positive would be we realized our skills are best used somewhere else. OK, I'd be saying I really enjoyed working in the Peter McVeary Trust and it really helped me hone my communication skills. And I know now my my interests are with whatever. OK, never say anything negative, but you do need to think about, you know, how you are going to package all these pieces. You don't want to walk out of the interview at the end. And say, oh, I forgot. Oh, no. Oh, my God. I forgot. So look, learn how to sell yourself in 10 minutes. And that takes a bit of practice. So I'll be sitting down, reading it out, thinking, what do I want to say? So the next part then is preparing for the competency interview. So all of the organizations work up this competency framework. It is absolutely critically important that you understand how you're going to apply it to yourself. So if you Google a thing like the STAR model, and I always feel like the Montessori teacher saying this, but honest to God, you really need to take a look at it. So the STAR model tells you how to answer a competency question properly. So I'll give you a question we will commonly ask. So I mentioned about the vulnerability of people with this. I mentioned about the room checks and health and safety. So for us, health and safety is really, really important. So one of our questions would be, can you tell me about the time you noticed a gap in relation to health and safety? So what was the gap and what did you do? OK, so I'll get answers like, yeah, I went into work and uh, there was a spill on the floor. So, you know, I dried it up. OK. So that's not given me a lot to go on. So I will be kind and say, okay, so where were you working? In a garage. I go, okay. And, and how big was it? Was there a shop? Yeah, there was. Okay. So was it a big spill? Did you see what's happening here? I'm kind of laboring the points like, okay? You want to know a higher order answer. It will be, you know, ask the same question. Well, I was doing my placement in the Peter McBerry Trust. So I was in Stevens Green. So that is a, a residence for homeless men. And there are 100 people in there. So it's very big and very busy. So there'd be a lot of football coming and going. And one day somebody spilled a cup of tea on the floor. So I knew there was a high probability somebody would slip on it. Now, it was a very busy corridor. I actually didn't even want to walk away from the spill on the floor because I was afraid somebody wouldn't see it. So I had a little walkie-talkie. So I radioed my colleague to bring the wet signs to mark the floors being wet and to bring them up. And I made the decision I was going to stand over that. So my colleague came with the signs and the mop. We dried it up. And then, you know, when the floor was dry, then we took away the wet signs. I can mean, you see the difference? Like that second person, I go, oh my God, we need to hire that person. Okay. You see the observed. They did a risk assessment. They took appropriate action. They made a decision. I need to stand here because this, this really could be somebody tripping and breaking their neck or breaking their leg. It could be a huge incident, you know, and then I got help. They didn't have to dry it up themselves. They identified, they got help. And then I got the story and I had a whole context around it because the minute they say 100 people, I'm going, Sheikers, that's huge. It must be so busy. So put context around it. So that is how you answer a competency question. OK, so think about times your communication was challenged. Think of things that went really well for you that you're really proud of. Think, think of things that did not go well. Think of incidents of challenging behavior that you observed. And what you want to do is you want to be able to relate all of those stories in exactly that second format that I gave. OK, 
where were you doing the placement? A little bit of background around it, big, small, the type of people who were there, a bit about the actual things that happened. Use the I word. I need to know the role that you played in this. What did you do? Okay. And then how did it finish up? Don't go from the mad drama. To, yeah, then it was all fine. Talk through all of the steps. And I suppose in an ideal mm -hmm. world, after listening to that person describing this, the spill on the floor in Stephen's Green, if I walked into Stephen's Green and saw a spill on the floor, I would probably do exactly what that person did. And the idea would be that we can replicate, you know, imagine what you would do in a situation in our services based on the answer that you give. So that is the amount of detail that you need to give. OK, so that would be what I'm saying is you need to prepare for the questions. OK, and really, you know, at the end of, of a, a, an interview, you'll probably be asked, is there anything else you'd like to add in support of your application? And if there are examples that you have thought about and stories you want to tell, please do tell them, because, again, you're just communicating that respect. I have spent time on this. I am really interested. And that's really, really important. It's really important to dress well as well. And it's really important to you know the things that you say. So commonly, I will have somebody in an interview and I'll ask them a question maybe around something and they go, probably shouldn't say this, but, okay? So if your inner voice is saying to you, you probably shouldn't say it. I am telling you loud and clear, do not say it. It's not appropriate. But as an interviewer, my responsibility is to Peter McBerry trust, okay? And if you're kind of suggesting to me you're going to tell me something but you're not sure, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to let you make that decision, okay? And if you proceed now to marry something that's not appropriate, now unfortunately you've made a poor decision. So it's really all about, we talk a lot about boundaries. Boundaries are really, really important. So it's really important in an interview that you hold that professional boundary as well. You know, personal examples are never acceptable personal experiences, you know, your best just stay away from them, okay? You know, it's it's really important that you're presenting the professional you and all your examples should be professional examples. They shouldn't be personal and it's not good to overshare, okay? I mean, I've had people, we'd ask about self-care, I've had people going, oh yeah, have a few glasses of wine, okay? Now look, I have no issue with anybody having a few glasses of wine, but we're working in an organization where so many people are addicted, you know? And I'm thinking, ah, oh, is that probably the best, you know, piece of self-care advice that they're sharing? Maybe they've walked for 10 kilometers beforehand. I would have preferred to heard about the 10 kilometer walk. OK, so just be mindful in the messages you're communicating and be mindful what you say is communicating you as a professional. And um, if you're not sure, you know, what people mean by the question, it's OK to say, sorry, would you, would you mind just saying that again? Because it is quite hard. You're sitting there and, you know, this HR and, and the uh, frontline manager, people firing questions at you. So it's much better just to say, can I have a moment? Or could you actually just break that down a small bit for me? None of us ever mind. And it's more important because then you're not wrong, because then you can answer the question. Um, and then I have that piece there about self-care as well. So... They'd be my top tips for interview, research, research, research. And it's not just me alone and the Peter McBray Trust saying, you know, uh, about doing the research in the organization. You know, I would talk to my colleagues in Simon, Focus Ireland, you know, all the different ones. And we had a, a very frank discussion one day and, and people were going, all of the recruitment people were going, why, what's the biggest reason people aren't passing the interview? Right. And I was sitting there and I would be saying to myself, I'd be afraid to say now people would come in front of me and Peter McVerry and I'd say, well, what do you know about the Peter McVerry Trust? And they go, oh, yeah, you work with the homeless people. And I go, yeah, and then what else do you know? And, and they wouldn't be able to answer. And I'd say, and did you look at the website? And people have sat and interviewed and said to me, I didn't have time. OK, and I was thinking, God, can I really share this with my, my, my peers? And then I thought, oh, look, best be honest. And in the spirit of honesty, I said, well, you know, and everyone went, oh, my goodness, you won't believe it happens to us as well. And as a collective, we're all sitting there going, how how can you go somewhere for an interview and know nothing about it? It is really, really unforgivable. You know, you don't have to go for every interview you're invited to. If you have no interest, that's absolutely fine. But just call it. Go, look, thank you very much for the opportunity to do, but I'm actually, you know, not going to proceed. But do yourself justice. And as I say, you know, no matter how stuck we all are for staff, there are some non-negotiables, okay? We can get over everything, but not having done that little bit of research. So I'd say to you, keep a list of where you're applying to, okay? And um, do a little bit 
a little bit of a read around where you're applying to. And, you know, and if somebody phones you and they catch you on the hop, you know, don't go into a call that you're not ready for because most people are doing this little phone call and a quick little, oh, why, are you, you know, Peter McBerry? And you don't have to give an awful lot. But, you know, if you're going to phone back, be ready for it. You know, listen to your voicemails is the other one I'd say to you. A lot of people haven't listened to the voicemails and have missed opportunities. You know, if somebody phones you and it's not a good time to talk, if you're heading into a lecture or something, go, oh, I really appreciate you phoning me. Look, I'm actually just going into a lecture. Is it okay if I phone back later? That's perfectly acceptable. But put yourself in a spot where you can set yourself up to show the person you are and to give a fair account of yourself. Because that's all you want to do is just give a fair account to yourself. So be ready for that quick phone screen. And then, you know, if you know people working in an organization, have a chat with them, okay? Just get a feel for them, what it's like working there and everything else, you know? And look, if you know people working for, say, Peter McBerry, and you don't get a chance, to, to, to talk to them before the interview, maybe don't bring it up in the interview. Oh, you know, I know five people working there. Because if you say that to me, absolute 100% guaranteed, I'm going to say to you, oh, brilliant. And were you chatting them before today? Because all I'm trying to do is make you feel comfortable. And by you saying that to me, it's an invitation to, to have the discussion. And then if you say to me, actually, no, I didn't bother, I'm like, okay, I'm a bit, you know, deflated. And nobody wants that. So, you know, think about what you're going to say. And, you know, as I say, you spent so long in education, so long getting ready for the perfect job. Do yourself justice and get ready for the interview because everything you prepare, you can use it wherever you go. And like, honestly, you will see people who come to interview bring a tear to your eye. They are so well prepared. They are so well repaired. And it's just the most wonderful, wonderful thing. And we're sitting there going, there's a team leader, there's the head of service. And you know what? I, I mean, I'd say now, like in the last few weeks, we've had a lot of people calling into the office, right? And we've all been locked away and haven't, I haven't seen any frontline for, for so long. And like, there's a string of people coming in who would have joined us over the last couple of years. And they're gone. They're now managers, heads, you know, they've really progressed in the organization. And they're it's the land of opportunity in Peter McBerry. You were so right. And I'd be laughing back and saying, but you know what? I still remember interviewing you. And they go, how can you remember interviewing me? And I go, because you were so brilliant, right? And they would have been coming out of college, but just the knowledge that with the ethos, but just it just resonate with you. And you just know this person is just gonna take on the world. And here they are taking on the world. So, you know, just put that time into getting yourself interview ready. And if anybody would like to apply for the Peter McFerry Trust. Our closing date is the 15th of April. All our details are on the uh, website. And what we've actually decided to do this year is we're actually interviewing as people apply because every year we change things. Previously, we've been sort of holding off until after the closing date and then getting all the interviews in May. And then, you know, it just wasn't really kind of the best way, maybe. So now what we're actually doing at the moment, we're actually interviewing. And I am delighted, so proud to say the quality of the people coming through is really 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 top class it's really fantastic and you know we've expanded so much over the last year with COVID we were opening up services like there was no tomorrow um, and like at the moment we're doing a huge piece of work with them um, we have a lot of services they're called um, bypass services so when people are coming in through direct provision they traditionally went straight to the HSE for for you know next stages and then to to to, to move up, move through the process so with COVID we a temporary uh, intervention from ourselves where people who came in as under, with refugee status went to stay in these temporary services for two weeks and it was all around the isolation around the COVID and you know just when you think things are beginning to wind down unfortunately that horrendous crisis in, in Ukraine kicked off and now we are really really busy working with people coming in from the Ukraine getting their PPS numbers you know sort of facilitating that transition so like we, we've opened up additional services to cope with that. So, so yeah, so look, as I say, between responding to the need and then our growing housing piece, our roles are always growing. You probably always see me advertising for housing in the regions and led. And the reason I'm all av always advertising is because the way that it works is for every 10 participants, let's say in housing first, we need an intensive case manager. So when we get another 10, we need another intensive case manager. So the team is just growing exponentially because we would be 
you know, hopefully on a monthly basis, maybe up in County Laird, getting between 10 and 20 people into their own homes. So we'll always have an ongoing requirement to build out the team. So I would love if some of you would like to apply. Um, I'd love to see you at interview. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me today. It's always a pleasure. And if you have any questions, then very happy to answer. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, the, the, the class is sitting in front of you and I know there's, there's some people online, but just I suppose from my own perspective, thank you so much, Joe, for as always your enthusiasm and practical insight into what the, the life is like with Peter McVerry, the heart and soul that guides and informs yeah. the work of Peter McVerry Trust. Um, and the practical insights of how to get in there, the hiring process, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the, the pitfalls that many of us can come across. And it's only when you fall into them that you realize, yeah, yeah. I should have prepared myself in a different way and just a little bit of a of, of a of a self-promotion here in, in in careers to to come down do the mock interviews with us get through the star story make sure the cvs yeah. are ready to submit and um, this particular closing date is the 15th of april the um that is over the Easter holidays for students, but the career service is open throughout that time, apart from the, the standard bank holidays. So do make sure that you do access that that support as well. Um, Breda, I'm not too sure if anybody in the class there in particular has any key questions that we can, I'll turn off the record, recording now as well so that people feel a little bit more comfortable. There is one question there about the families share the house unit. So the way the family service 